Welcome Rana Zinn from the University of Leipzig to uh, give the next talk on sums of squares and projective geometry. Okay, thank you. Um, so this talk may be a little different than the rest of the workshop, so I'll try to give um, a bit of an introduction and an overview um, about this whole point of view of projective geometry on sums of squares, which I have recently developed mostly with Greg Blackerman and other co-authors. And so feel free to ask a lot of questions. So we have two hours. I think we need to take a break in between and we'll see how far we get. So you can ask lots of questions if you want. I also have some links here. So I mostly be talking about these three papers. So the first one is a survey paper and then there's two other research papers. Um, and I also made an exercise sheet, which I think Lynn posted on the workshop website, but we'll come to that maybe later. So what am I going to talk about? So I want to first give maybe a, make a philosophical point um, with this very simple example that was studied in great detail by Stengler. So I'm just looking at this pre-order in one variable here, x times um, 1 minus x, which just defines the 0, 1 interval on the real line. And it's easy to see, it's an exercise to check that every non-negative polynomial in one variable, or negative on the interval, is in this pre-order. So it can be written as a sum of squares plus a sum of squares times the inequality defining the interval. So that is my notation here. Um, so that is a very basic exercise using, you know, factorization of you know, negative polynomials, for example, into linear factors over C. But what is more interesting to me today is that this thing is stable. Um, so here's an abstract definition of what it means to be stable. It means that I can bound the degrees that I need for these sum of squares multipliers just in terms of the degree of the polynomial that I want to represent. So suppose I want to write a polynomial in the pre-order and it has some fixed degree d, then I can write it in this pre-order using these sums of squares, weights, and I can bound the degree as a function only of the degree of f. So for example, what often enters in these bounds other than the degree is, for example, the minimum of the function on the set. So this is not allowed if I want it to be stable. And I want to be able to bound the degrees of the sum of squares multipliers only in terms of the degree of f and not other features like the minimum or so. So this is stable. However, you may know that if you change the exponent of the inequality, just to be slightly annoying maybe, you change it to 3. So of course, it describes the same set. I've just cubed the polynomial. It doesn't change the sign it takes. However, this pre-order is no longer stable. And, you know, Stengler very carefully um, bounded the degree of the sum of squares weights in terms of the minimum and so on. So he studied this very explicitly and very carefully. And that is really sad in many ways. And it's, I think, something that you are all very used to. Um, the quality of moment relaxations and so on does not only depend on the geometry of the set, but it often depends also on your choice of describing, of defining inequalities. And that's the thing I don't want, you know, I want statements in terms of the geometry of the set, and so I want to avoid this choice of um, inequality. So I want to focus on geometric aspects and the interval is a very simple geometric object. And I don't want to worry about um, choosing the correct inequalities um, that reflect the geometry and that imposes constraints on what kind of sets I can look at. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at algebraic sets. Um, so where you have equations defining your set, no inequalities, that has the advantage that there is the ideal defining the set. So there is no choice of inequalities and I can really hope for statements about sums of squares, for example, and so on, that are only in terms of geometric properties of the set. So that's the philosophical point I want to make. I want to avoid semi-algebraic sets and constraints and focus on algebraic sets and geometric properties of those. 
And so what is an example of the kind of thing that I'll be looking at? I will essentially look at the global case that you're all, I think, more or less familiar with, but um, global will mean not only Rn, which is the traditional global case, but will soon be replaced by an algebraic set. And I will be looking at sums of squares then, right? So I have no constraints. So the pre-order corresponding to the global case is the set of sum of squares of polynomials. And the first thing to note maybe is this sort of exercise number one, I think, on my exercise sheet is that this is very, very stable. The sums of squares in the global case are really as stable as anything can be. So you can not only bound the degrees of the weights, the sum of squares weights that you use, which in this case just means you only have sums of squares, there are no inequalities, but you can really restrict even the support um, of these equations in the following sense. So if you write a polynomial as a sum of squares of other polynomials, then the Newton polytope, which I will explain in an example in a second, is really contained in one half Newton polytope of the polynomial that comes out. In particular, this is a degree bound, but it's even stronger than a degree bound. So here's an example. I think we've seen the Motzkin polynomial this week um, several times. So here's the Motzkin polynomial in two variables. And now I'm going to draw its Newton polytope in blue. So which means I will collect the exponent vectors of the monomials that have non-zero coefficients. So for example, here x to the fourth y squared will become the point for two. And this monomial, which has a non-zero coefficient, is the point two four. This one is the origin, zero, zero, and this one is the point two two. And I take the convex hull of these four lattice points and I get the Newton polytope, which looks like this triangle. And then one half just means take one half, you know, you take every point in your lattice polytope and take one half of it, then you get a smaller polytope that also has four lattice points. And the summons that you can take here can only have these four monomials. So that's the constant. This is x times y, this is x squared y, and this is x y squared. These are the only four monomials that are allowed in any polynomial that you want to square to add up to the Matskin polynomial, and that's the usual proof why it cannot be a sum of squares. Um, okay, and then, you know, Hilbert asked this question back in the 19th century, so he wanted the classification of all cases when non-negative polynomials um, are sum of squares. So there is, I think, a question. Why can I not go back? In the first example, if I square it, the pre-order is the sums of squares. Yes, right? If I square here, um, so I wanted to take, maybe this is not very readable, right? So this is supposed to be a three. Um, indeed, if you put a two, then it is stable because then I have no inequality. I'm just writing down the sums of squares. So maybe this typo was the issue. <laughs> Okay. Yes, so the question is, when is every non-negative polynomial sum of squares? And the question, of course, does not make sense as stated like this, um, and Hilbert did not state it like this, because we need, of course, constraints, right? Um, every non-negative polynomial is a sum of squares only in one variable, so we need to sort of restrict our set somehow, and the restriction that Hilbert chose is you want to fix the number of variables and the degrees that you will have. So you ask, when is every non-negative polynomial of degree at most 17 in eight variables for sum of squares? Degree 17 is not very clever, but anyway, then it would make more sense. And so he gave a classification in terms of this constraint. And the answer is there are few cases. So every non-negative polynomial in one variable is the sum of squares regardless of the degree. Um, in any number of variables, every non-negative quadratic form or quadratic polynomial is a sum of squares. And then there is this one exceptional case. If you take three variables and polynomials of degree at most four, um, then every non-negative, this is called ternary quartic, is a sum of squares. 
So there's a very old result and we will try to um, generalize this. So this is a question in the global case, right? Every non-negative polynomial here means globally. And if we substitute globally by an algebraic set, we can ask the same question. But again, we need to sort of make some choice of what set of polynomials we want to look at. And I'll come to this question and its generalization in a second. So, or another question you can ask, which I will address also later, is instead of asking for the number of variables and degree, you can also ask for constraints, for example, on the Newton polytope, or if you only allow certain uh, monomials, you want sparse polynomials. One is every sparse non-negative polynomial sum of squares. So you can ask questions, more refined questions like this, and of course then this theorem does not give you an answer because it will depend on your choice of support. And these methods that I'm going to talk about give some, um, some methods to deal with this kind of question. So let's first maybe take this graph matrix method to try to write the polynomial as a sum of squares. I think this is the standard method, um, but I'll maybe take a slightly different point of view on this. So we're given a polynomial and we just want to write it as a vector of monomials times the symmetric matrix of the appropriate size times a vector of monomials. And of course we have to choose the size appropriately depending on the degree of the polynomial f. So for example, if we only have one variable and we do degree six, then I can fit this problem on the slide still. And then we would write um, the vector of monomials up to degree three. And then we would try to write this polynomial as a, so for me, this is writing it as a quadratic form. A is a quadratic form or a symmetric matrix in monomials of degree at most three. That's how I want to read this equation. And then um, it's an exercise to check using whatever you want to call it, maybe the finite dimensional spectral theorem, maybe the principal axis theorem, that the polynomial is a sum of squares if and only if you can find a positive semi-definite A here, um, such that G of A is equal to F. Okay, so Let's maybe try a support example. So here is a polynomial with parametric coefficients a, b, c, and d, and its support, the monomials that occur, are exactly the same as in the Monskin polynomial. Um, and then we can use this example from before, or we can use this constraint on the support to also, um, sorry, this is a typo here that does not make a lot of sense. Um, so you take a four by four symmetric matrix. Um, maybe I can write this instead. So it should be a four by four symmetric matrix. And you make a polynomial. Anyway, so this should be, you know, this over here should be polynomials in X and Y. Okay. So, you only take those monomials that are in one half the Newton polytope of F, which is the smaller triangle with the only lattice points being the origin, uh, 2, 1, 1, 2, and 1, 1, corresponding to these four monomials in X and Y. And then um, if F is a sum of squares, you can find a positive semi-definite four by four matrix A, such that this polynomial here will be equal to F. So that is sort of, you can use the sparsity information on this polynomial to make your ground map a little small. Okay, so this is, you can use the support constraint uh, with the lemma two slides ago, I think. Okay, and then, as I said, I want to read this as writing this polynomial as a quadratic form in monomials. And I can take, of course, monomials from a different set, you know, like the support constraint. I can, I don't need to take all monomials up to a certain degree in my given number of variables, but I can put any constraint I want on the set of monomials. So, for example, the sort of all 
monomials up to a certain degree from the point of view of projective geometry or algebraic geometry gets the word Veronese embedding associated to it. So here's an example of degree two in three variables. Um, so you take, you take three variables and you make the vector of monomials um, of degree two, exactly two in three variables out of it. There are six of them. Um, the algebraic projective geometry people like it homogeneously, so they, we always fix um, degree to be equal um, to two, not at most two, or equal to four, not at most four. And there's a simple transition between the two cases, which is called homogenization, sort of not so important. Um, but this vector of monomials of a fixed degree in a given number of variables um, gets has the name Veronese embedding associated to it, and so for me, you can look at this from R3 to R6, which won't cause much many problems in this talk, but for me, um, this is really a map from P2, from projective two space, from the projective plane into a projective five space. And what we're going to do um, is to look at quadratic forms on R6, so symmetric six by six matrices, and we want to restrict to the image of this map image of this map and what we get out is exactly a polynomial of degree three uh, degree four in three variables we just multiply this out and so the gram map for sort of this ternary quartic case really means that you're looking to restrict a quadratic form to the image of this map and that's sort of what we're going to do more generally the image of this map here the set inside R6 or in P5 is an algebraic variety and we're considering quadratic forms restricted to these algebraic varieties. That's the setup that I'll be working in for the rest of the talk. And here I gave the example of a degree two embedding of P2, but you can do this of course in any degree in any number of variables. And this is always called the Veronese embedding of P2, Pn, the d upper embedding is another main. Anyway, you can also model the uh, support constraint that we saw before in terms of algebraic geometry. Um, then you draw your support for the polynomials that you need to square. So in the Modskin case, right, these are the f the supports of the fi's that I want to square to get, for example, the Modskin polynomial, and associated to such a lattice polytope is a monomial map. In this case, we have two variables x and y, and we have four lattice points, so we end up in a four-dimensional space. And what we're going to do is we're going to map a point x, y to the evaluation of the monomials at this point, right? So the monomial one, of course, is constant one, and then this monomial is x, y, and so on. Evaluate the monomials given by the polygon in this case, by the lattice polytope at each point. So, this is more general. Of course, the Veronese embeddings are also of this form. When this polygon would be, so for the Veronese case, this would be a triangle. So, this polygon would give a Veronese embedding, and if I think hard, then this would probably be a four. Anyway, so, and this setup, this kind of operation to make from a lattice polytope a variety, which is the image of this map, is the subject of toric geometry. Such varieties are called toric varieties. And in this case, you can check that the image is what is known as a cubic surface. So it's a two-dimensional variety for me in P3, okay? which is given homogeneously by this equation. So if I choose coordinates z0 up to z3 um, on this R4, then you can check that whenever you plug in such a vector of monomials into this equation, you get zero. This is just saying if you multiply one times xy squared times x squared y, you get x cubed y cubed, right, this equation. So this certainly vanishes on every such vector of monomials. And conversely, you can write almost every um, solution to this equation 
in this form and you have to say almost every because of this one. There are some exceptions to this. Okay, and this is an example for this specific simple lattice polygon. And as I said, you can do this for every so-called lattice polytope, which means it's a polytope and all of its vertices have to be points on the um, integer lattice in Rn. Like, right, you cannot have fractional or even real um, non-integer vertices for your point. Okay, and so here's now um, the general setup that I want to work in. So I will fix the projective variety in Pn. So for example, the Veronese surface or the toric cubic surface that we just saw. And the object I'll be interested in is the non-negative polynomials, which for me will mean that I only look at quadratic forms and they have to be non-negative evaluated on the points given by my variety. So that is my substitute for limiting the number of variables and degree in Hilbert's example. So the number of variables in a sense is given by x and the degree is always 2. Um, so I will restrict to this and I want to know the usual thing. Oh yeah, okay, here's an example. If I take the Veronese surface, this cone is really, as we saw, the cone of non-negative polynomials in three variables of degree at most or exactly four um, in this homogeneous case. And then I will be comparing this cone, of course, to the cone of sums of squares. So I want a quadratic to come out in the end, which the homogeneous setup is always stable, um, um, meaning I take linear forms, I square linear polynomials, it makes a quadratic polynomial, and I wonder if they give the given one, but of course, I can, this sort of quadratic form, as soon as I restrict it to x, it's sort of not unique. There's many quadratic forms that restrict to the same function on x because there might be quadratic functions that are identically zero. So this is supposed to be understood, this sum of squares is equal to this quadratic form modulo those that vanish identically on, s, on x, which form the ideal. Um, and so this is the vector space of quadratic forms modulo those that are identically zero on x. So we'll see an example in a second. And then you can of course ask the question when is when are the two cones equal as usual, right? And this time I can hope for an answer in terms of really geometric properties that this algebraic set x might have. And so historically, the first theorem in this direction was proven by Greg Blackerman, Greg Smith, and Mauricio Velasco. So here's a list of some assumptions that you need. Um, so you need this algebraic set to be irreducible, which is some topological property if you want. Um, one way to say it is that the defining ideals or the polynomial functions that vanish identically on the set form a prime ideal. That's an equivalent way of saying irreducible, so that's some geometric assumption. Totally real really means only that it has enough real points, so there's mean things, you know, you can write down an algebraic set that doesn't have any real solutions. We're not interested in those, right? We want to evaluate the quadratic forms at real solutions to our polynomial equation, so we need to have enough real points, and that's what this means. Um, so if you look at the points, yeah, anyway. So this is a technical assumption. And this non-degenerate is also a technical assumption. This only means that there is no linear function that vanishes identically on x. And then there is a nice answer. So the answer is the cones are equal. Every non-negative quadratic form is the sum of squares of linear forms, if and only if this identity of geometric um, invariance of x whole, right? So this is an equal, it's not very readable. And these are really geometric invariants. So the co-dimension is just sort of the ambient dimension of x uh, minus its dimension. So if x is in Pn, so it's in an n-dimensional space, then co-dimension x is simply n minus the dimension of x. 
And the degree is the geometric invariant that counts how many points you get if you take a, a random slice. So for example, if X is a curve, if it's a one-dimensional object and you intersect with one linear equation, then you will probably have finitely many solutions and the degree tells you how many you should see. Or if you have a surface, if you have a two-dimensional object, you have to intersect twice. If you intersect with one e linear equation, the dimension will go down by one from two to one. And if you then add another random linear equation, you will see finitely many points and the degree tells you how many solutions you will have. Okay. So now, why can I not delete things? It's very sad. I have to do it the slow way. Okay, and this theorem by Blackman, Smith, and Velasco implies the original Hilbert's theorem by a classification theorem in algebraic geometry by Bertini and Del Pezzo. And what you have to do to recover Hilbert's theorem is you have to look at those axes that are Veronese embeddings. You have to check which Veronese embeddings satisfy this property that their degree is equal to co-dimension x plus one. Because restricting to a Veronese embedding is the same constraint as saying we fix the number of variables and we fix the degree, but nothing else, no other information. And then, you know, which ones of these, which Veronese embeddings um, satisfy this can be found in this list by Bertini and Del Pezzo. Okay, then later on in follow-up work with Greg Blackman and Mauricio Velasco, we generalized this theorem. So the difference here is, if you look at the list of assumptions, that this irreducible is now gone and this non-degenerate is not important anymore, but this non-degenerate is sort of not important anymore. It's not the main, um, the main point of these theorems anyway. So, but the important point is the irreducible went away from in comparing the assumptions of these two theorems. But also the conclusion changed. Um, so P of X equals Sigma X is the same. I still wonder um, when every quadratic, non-negative quadratic is a sum of squares. And the answer now is in terms of some other algebraic invariant that's a little more complicated, which is called the castelnovo manfold regularity. And this number has to be two. It's in a sense as small as it can get. So this number is one, the regularity number, if and only if your x is a linear space. And so linear spaces are kind of boring. So if you make the number one larger, they're sort of the simplest varieties that are not linear spaces. And those are the ones where sigma x, where every non-negative quadratic form is a sum of squares. Um, so this is one way to think about this number. It's an algebraic invariant that I can tell you more about if you want, but you have to sort of do some commutative algebra to even define this number. Anyway, and so you can, of course, compare these two conditions. So you might wonder, what does this have to do with this? And then there's a theorem by Eisenbart and Goto that if you add irreducible and you have this assumption, then you get this equality. So of course, this is as it should be, right? If you add irreducible here, then of course you can walk along these equivalences from regularity to, to degree of x is co-dimension x plus one. And the direct route from here to there is this theorem by Eisenbach and Gould. Um, right, did I want to say something else? Okay, so another thing that you can get out of this um, is a classification of supports. So this is this original theorem by Fleckerman, Smith, and Velasco. The generalized version with this regularity is not needed here. And you can wonder if you fix the support of your polynomial f, right? So I fix the lattice polytope. And you can think of it as the support, the Newton polytope of my polynomial f that I want to write as the sum of squares. And you can ask the same question. When is every non-negative polynomial whose Newton polytope is, let's say, contained in this P, in this candidate Newton polytope, a sum of squares? And then you can give a list of these. Um, this is also follows from this Del Pezzo-Bertini theorem. Um, 
And there are sort of four types or cases, some are types, some are cases of Newton polytopes for which every non-negative polynomial is a sum of squares. The first one is essentially univariate polynomial, so it can happen that your polytope is just a line segment. Then every non-negative polynomial will be a sum of squares. So this corresponds essentially to univariate polynomials. The case of quadratic forms reappears, of course, so that means that your lattice polytope, so here it's the lattice polytope of the resulting sum of squares, so if we want the support of the things that we sum up, we have to take one half. So this is the Newton polytope of a linear form, right? A linear polynomial had a constant coefficient, then an x1 and an xn. Yeah? So this is the standard simplex, is the Newton polytope of a general linear function. And if you square them, of course, you get quadratic things. Then there are the ternary vortex from Hilbert's theorem again. So their Newton polytope is a triangle. The origin is a vertex and then sort of x squared and y squared are the other vertices for the things that we square. This is an exceptional case. This is not a family of any kind. And then there are these more complicated examples that are known as Lorentz prisms in toric geometry. So here's how you construct them. Let's maybe first talk about the construction. So you start with a simplex here. You start with the standard basis vectors in Rn, and their convex hull makes a simplex. So, for example, here a triangle. And then these Hi's are heights. So for every vertex of your simplex, you assign a height and you lift this vertex out of the plane of the, or hyperplane of the simplex in a new coordinate direction. So here E1 plus height 1 in a new coordinate direction, En plus 1. And you do this for every vertex and you can choose different heights. And then you take the uh, convex hull of these two endpoints. So the base is a simplex, a triangle, and then you lift these points up, but you can sort of skew this top triangle that you get in the this case. So I attempted to draw a three-dimensional picture of this. Um, so here this maybe is the highest height that we lift any of the three vertices to and then these are a little lower and so we get a triangle on top that is skewed. So these are the only other types of polytopes but they exist in any dimension for any n, so this is a family, and for any heights that you might assign. And it turns out that these cases were known before. So this case, so these cases are Hilbert's theorem, one, two, three. This case was known before that polynomials of this form are sums, non-negative polynomials of this form are sums of squares by work of Choi Lam and Resnick. And they call these polynomials biforms for reasons that are maybe less clear at the moment. Um, and so this case also was known. Uh, maybe the interesting part of this conclusion, and that's really the, the kind of thing that these techniques can prove, is that this is a complete list. There are no other cases. It's not like anything went forgotten or hasn't been looked at. This is really a complete list. There are no other cases of supports where every non-negative polynomial is a sum of squares. And so it's kind of interesting to me that they have been discovered individually and that now finally we can prove that this is really a complete list of such polynomials. Okay, so then I think I will start with a new topic. So if you have any questions, maybe it's a good time to ask me. Uh, yes, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, this is Lorenzo Baldi from Iria. I, I wanted to ask you some questions about the classification theorem of mm -hmm. positive polynomials and uh, sum of squares. Mm -hmm. um, so, the first question is, is there a relationship between, between the singularity of the variety X with, with this uh, regularity of X equal to two condition? So the X has to be non-singular or no, can be singular. So, it can be singular. It turns out after the fact that the singularities that it can have are very restricted. Okay. 
but you don't have to assume non-singularity. So the regularity too, so the only singularities that it has are when components intersect. It turns out, right? So okay. every component is smooth or a cone. Um, so the singular locus is a linear space or components intersect, but otherwise they are smooth, it turns out. Okay, okay. So there are no cusps or things like no. that? Okay. And maybe uh, uh, going away a bit from the past you mentioned at the beginning, this condition on the regularity seems to be very algebraic. So mm -hmm. what if X is not a variety, but it's a scheme more generally? Can you say something? Or maybe this is related with the techniques that you use for the proof? Uh, the schemey situation often tends to be affine. Um, and then you get different kinds of answers. The non-completeness gives you different kinds of... So, yeah, I don't know a good answer at the moment off the top of my head. So we didn't really look at scheme strong. They only cause problems in a way, you know? <laughs> so we want the saturated radical ideal um, corresponding to it because otherwise you don't know the kernel of your ground map, right? Essentially. So if you want a schemey thing, so let's see. So the ideal is really the kernel of this ground map, right? So to think about this, this ground map sometimes maps some things to zero. Did I put my connection? No. Mm -hmm. Weird. It looks weird to me. What I'm anyway. So and so there is a fiber over the zero polynomial, right? In this yes. ground, usually, of course. And that should really be the ideal um, in degree two. And if it's not, then you're kind of you're missing equations, and then it's not clear. What you're trying to do if you try to write it as a sum of squares, right? Because you're only allowing some kernel which is too small. Okay. So it's kind of, okay. you can of course worry about what happens, but it's very difficult to get a meaningful statement because you don't know what kind of subset of the kernel you've chosen for your scheme. It's very hard to characterize, you know, if it's not radical, what have yes, you really done? Um, hard to say. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you. And maybe a last question. Uh, can you give a brief idea how um, the fact that the variety is the Zariski closure of the real points affect the proof? So it's important to have enough real points. Um, so what we're going, to, what we're always doing here is really we're doing the moment problem. We look at the dual convex cone to the cone of sums of squares. That's mm -hmm. the one we can understand. Um, and so the dual cone of non-negative polynomials is very easy to describe. Being non-negative means that if you evaluate it at a point, the polynomial is non-negative. And this evaluation at a point is, of course, a linear function mm -hmm. on non-negative polynomials. So these point evaluations, they span the dual, they span the true moment cone, right? These are the Dirac measures. This is really the dual cone of the moment problem, and then the spectrohedron, the dual cone to the sums of squares, that's sort of the thing that you can check. The moment matrix is positive semi-definite, but this is always too large. Oh, I mean, it tends to be too large. It's not always. And the difference is really in, in this question. Is this spectrohedron, the dual cone to sums of squares, larger than the moment cone, the true moment cone? Mm -hmm. For this to work, you know, for the moment cone to be what I just said, you need this totally real. Okay. So that you have enough points, right? The point evaluations at real points make the moment cone. And if you have too few real points, then your moment cone is wrong. Okay. That's sort of why we need this assumption. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you a lot for the answers. Sure. Okay. I know. So we take a short break. Is everyone tired? We can take five minute break or I can keep talking. 
So I'll finish early if I keep talking anyway. So we might as well try to recover before I start. This is really a new topic in itself. All right, in that case, should we have uh, just a five minute break and uh, reconvene at uh, quarter two? Is that okay, Vervo? Sounds good to me. Okay. Okay. Thank Okay, I think it's been uh, five minutes. So if you're ready to, to go again. Sure. Thank you. All right. So you might ask the question, why did we want to generalize this theorem here on this slide and get rid of this irreducibility assumption? So from an algebraic geometry point of view, you always might wonder, irreducible is fine. Why worry about other things? And this matrix completion business is one example. Or this was mainly our motivating example to do this work. 
So let's maybe set this up. So the question is very simple. I want to complete a matrix. So here's a three by three matrix, which is partially specified. And so I have these one, two, three, four entries. And I, there are two missing entries. And you can ask different questions about this completion. So I want to complete to a symmetric matrix. So in this case, there are two entries missing. It suffices to fill in the upper half of the matrix, for example. And you can ask questions like, can I do this in such a way that this matrix, for example, becomes positive semi-definite? What's the answer in this example? Can I complete this to a positive semi-definite matrix by filling in these two question marks? I want a symmetric real PSD matrix. Can I do this? Any opinions? Should we make a poll? Anybody want to guess yes or no? No guess so far. Okay, so the answer here in this example would be no, because of this minus two. So for example, if you plug in zero, zero, one into this quadratic form, you get a negative value. So here would be no way, but you can ask, of course, other questions. So what is the smallest possible rank that you can complete such a matrix to? Sometimes in some contexts, it's interesting to ask if it has a positive definite completion, which in this case, it of course does not have either. So these are the types of questions that you can ask. Um, and so what I'm going to do is I'm not going to focus on a specific matrix and how to complete, for example, this specific matrix to a positive semi-definite matrix, which is not possible in this example. But what I want to do is I want to focus on the pattern of the entries that we know and those that we don't know. So this is an instance of this pattern of a matrix. I know the three diagonal entries and this one three entry and one two and two three are missing. Um, and then I want to ask questions like, can I complete every matrix where you know I fill in the stars to be any real number such that maybe obvious necessary conditions are satisfied to a positive semi-definite matrix. I will ask questions of this type, you know, do, fixing the pattern of known and unknown entries. Can I do something for all of the matrices that have this pattern and satisfy some obvious conditions? Can I complete them to PSD matrices? It's the type of question that we're going to ask. And of course, the obvious necessary condition you can impose is that if you want a PSD matrix, then you know that all of the sort of principal minors, or I never quite know what the correct word is, you know, you take all of the symmetric submatrices where you know every entry, and then these have to be PSD, of course. Or I think here, principal minors are really the determinants of these submatrices. So, for example, here, if I take, I know this two by two submatrix, this two by two symmetric submatrix is completely determined. And here the determinant is minus three, I guess. Anyway, it's negative. Um, so this matrix cannot have a positive semi definite completion because this minor already certifies that this is impossible. And so I have sort of written this out from matrix. From this partial matrix, you can also write down the corresponding quadratic form. So what have I done? I've multiplied this matrix M from the left and right with the vector x1, x2, x3 of variables. And then this partial matrix determines the coefficient of x1 squared, x2 squared, x3 squared, and of the monomial x1 times x2. So this here should be a 7, right? Uh, this 4 is this 2, and then I do not know the coefficient, if I think of this as a quadratic form, of the monomial x1 times x3 corresponding to this question mark, and x2 times x3 corresponding to this question mark. And the fact that this minor here is not positive semi-definite can be certified by evaluating this quadratic 
quadratic form at the point, um, where the last coordinate corresponding to this column or this row is the same, where we have question marks being zero, right? So if I plug in this vector into this quadratic form, it doesn't matter that I do not know these coefficients because these monomials go away anyway, because I plug in x3 equals zero. Or in other words, if you multiply this vector from left and right, you only need to know the entries in this two by two minor to compute uh, the number that comes out, which is minus two. And so this is a proof, this is a certificate that you cannot complete this partial matrix to a three by three positive semi-definite matrix because you already have a counterexample coming from this minor. Okay, so if you do this example, um, any guesses? Can you do this here or not? Does this one have a PSD completion? Well, no. Oh dear. Yes or no, we've practiced. So the two by two minors do not cause problems, right? The two by two minor here evaluates to zero, zero, zero. And we also know this one, the one four two by two minor, right? So this creature also evaluates to zero. So there is no obvious um, certificate that this cannot be completed. And then it turns out in this example, it can be completed to a PSD matrix because you can make it have circular structure almost. You know, it's a very symmetric matrix. I think if you put in one for both question marks, you get a rank two, I think. Anyway, I think you get a PSD completion. Okay, so now maybe we should formalize this a little bit. So how do I describe the pattern and sort of the what is this sometimes called? I think sometimes it's also called the mask or the window, something like this. Anyway, so I want to encode this pattern of entries that I know and those, of course, then also that I don't know in terms of an associated graph to the pattern. And what I'm going to do throughout is I'm always going to assume that I know the diagonal entries. will not worry about a uh, diagonal entry being unknown, which is also interesting, but it's technically very different from what I want to do. So I'm going to ignore this interesting case. And so I only need to remember which of the off diagonal entries do we know. And this I will just identify with an edge in a graph. So here um, for this four by four matrix, I will draw a graph on four vertices and I will draw an edge if the corresponding entry is specified. So this edge one, two corresponds to the fact that I want to know this entry. And the missing of edge one, four says the one, four entry is not specified, right? So this graph has two missing edges, one, four and two, four are missing. And if you do it like this, it turns out that the fully specified symmetric Submatrices correspond to complete subgraphs of your graph, right? So you want to know everything, so you need to have every edge. And having a complete subgraph means you know every entry of this corresponding submatrix. So um, this pattern that we saw in the example before corresponds to the four cycle. We always know the four diagonal entries. We know one, two, two, three, three, four, one, four. That's the four cycle. And the two missing diagonals are these two missing entries. And the maximum submatrices here are two by two. As soon as you pick three rows and the same three columns, you will have at least one missing entries because these edges are the only complete subgraphs of the four cycle. And then I want to ask, you know, given this pattern, fixing the graph, when is every partial matrix? that satisfies the obvious necessary condition, the Sylvester criterion, completable to a positive semi-definite matrix? That's the kind of question I want to ask. And um, this depends, of course, on the graph, and maybe we can characterize those graphs, those patterns for which this holds. And this is exactly a question of the type I asked before. You know, it depends on, this is quadratic forms on an algebraic set, on a projective variety described by a very nice ideal. And this is sort of combinatorial commutative algebra. And here is the correct ideal to look at. It's called the Stanley Reasoner ideal. This is a general 
construction in combinatorial commutative algebra that takes a simplicial complex and out of a simplicial complex it makes an ideal. And in the graph case it's particularly easy, so the corresponding ideal we want to look at is generated by um, polynomials of degree 2, xi times xj, and the indices of the variables should correspond to the missing edges in the graph. So the non-edges of the graph make the generators of the Stanley least ideal. And then this is an ideal in a polynomial ring with n variables corresponding to the number of vertices of the graph, and we pick, say, real coefficients. So for example, for the four cycle, we have two missing edges, one, three, and two, four. So the corresponding ideal is generated by the monomial, the quadratic monomial corresponding to the missing edge, one, three, and the quadratic monomial corresponding to the missing edge, two, four. Okay, and then I claim what I just said, you know, every partially specified matrix whose pattern matches this given graph G is actually a quadratic form red modulo the Stanley Reason ID. So every partial matrix M with pattern G is in one-to-one -one correspondence with the class of a quadratic form where we do not specify these coefficients. So if you go back to this example, so here the graph, maybe we can draw the graph, is a graph on three vertices, yes? We have a three by three matrix, but the only, let's we have to label them, one, two, three, and the only non-diagonal entry that we know is one, two. So this is the corresponding graph. So the corresponding Stanley Riesner ideal, G, doo -doo 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 -doo. so IG, is the ideal generated by the two missing edges. And these are exactly the two monomials that appear over here. And not knowing this coefficient is the same as sort of saying we read it modulo, this monomial, right? Because the equivalence class modulo this monomial really means that you can change this coefficient to be anything, which is the same as saying you sort of don't specify it at all. You can change it to be anything, you might as well not fix it, right? And that's really all I'm saying. You know, all I'm saying is if you compute modulo the standard reason ideal, it's the same as saying you do not specify the coefficients of the monomials in the standard reason ideal, which are exactly those monomials that correspond to the question marks in your matrix. All I'm saying in this first part of the proposition. So, these partially specified matrices are the same as equivalence classes of quadratic forms modulo the non-specified monomials in the standard reason ideal. And then we can also say when they have a positive semi-definite completion in terms of the corresponding quadratic forms of polynomial of degree two, namely they have a positive semi-definite completion if and only if you can write it as a sum of squares of linear. So this is really the same as the ground matrix method. If you write it as a sum of squares and you write the corresponding ground matrix to the sum of squares representation, then this ground matrix is the completion, is the positive semi-definite completion you are looking for in this theorem and the other way around. If you complete it to a positive semi-definite matrix, then you can take this as a ground matrix, so you compute a Koleski factorization and you get your sum of squares of linear forms. So we're really doing the ground matrix, and to sort of convince yourself of this is an exercise. And the point of this slide is that we're really asking the same question that I set up in the first part. We have non-negative quadratic forms on an algebraic set Xg, and we want to know when is every non-negative quadratic form on Xg a sum of squares of linear forms. It's the same as saying every G partial matrix that satisfies the obvious Sylvester criterion can be completed to a sum of squares. And we want to characterize the graphs G for which this is the case. Okay, so here, here is another example of a G partial matrix for the four cycle. So we only have missing entries 1, 3, and 2, 4. 
And here's the corresponding quadratic form and the two monomials in the standard reason ideal are the missing ones where we do not specify the coefficient or the entry of the matrix. Okay. So, and then there was a completion theorem um, from the 80s by Grohn, Johnson, Sy, and Volkowitz that really characterizes the answer to the question I just asked. You know, they say that the sort of to check the Sylvester criterion on every completely determined submatrix is sufficient for the existence of a PSD completion if and only if the pattern comes corresponds to a chordal graph. And only if the graph is chordal. Chordal has various equivalent definitions. It's a very important notion in various fields. It appears in numerical linear algebra, it appears in combinatorics, it appears in optimization. You know. And one definition you can give is that there is no induced cycle of length at least four. So the four cycle is not chordal, for example. Um, another way of saying it is that the graph is a click sum of complete graphs, or another way of saying it is that the graph has a perfect elimination order, and so on and so forth. So there's a hundred equivalent definitions of what it means to be called. And the point is that this is an example of the theorem that I showed you that we proved about this non-reducible case. So every quadratic form non-negative on such an algebraic set is the sum of squares, if and only if this has this weird regularity two condition. And it turns out that this regularity two condition for a Stanley Riesler ideal associated to a graph is equivalent to the graph being chordal. And that's a theorem in combinatorial commutative algebra due to Fulberg, incidentally published in the exact same year as the matrix completion theorem, of course, completely independently, and this connection was not known. And that was really our main motivation to study the matrix completion problem, to generalize the setup from irreducible algebraic sets to also just general algebraic sets, and in particular these sets coming from standard reason ideas. It turns out that the algebraic set XG is also particularly nice. It's a union of linear spaces. The linear spaces are even coordinate subspaces, and the coordinate subspaces that you take also correspond to complete subgraphs of G. So it's again an exercise to verify that the set of all points where all of these monomials vanish is really a union of coordinate subspaces corresponding to the complete subgraphs of G. So in this example here, um, you would see the XG would be four lines in P3. Or if you want, four two-dimensional coordinate subspaces of four-dimensional space. Just the same. Okay. So let me just mention one of Monique's results in this direction. So he, she has worked in the past on these matrix completion problems. And um, one question, so this is sort of a union of two questions. It's first of all, the positive semi-definite completion question that we've just studied on the slide before, mixed with the question of what is the smallest possible rank that you can complete something to. And so, she called this together in a paper with Vaviciotis, the gram dimension of a graph. So you fix your graph and you look at those matrices that, partial matrices that have some PSD completion. And then you want to know for every matrix that you complete the smallest possible rank of a positive semi-definite completion. And then you take the max over this min, right? This is the max min number. So for every completable matrix, you take the minimal rank of a PSD completion. And then you take the maximum of these minimal ranks over all matrices where this number exists, right? So <clears throat> the number such that for any completable matrix, there exists a completion whose rank is bounded by this number, and it's small as such. Okay. And uh, it turns out that this is related to the number of squares that you need. So translated into my language, right? Such a M here is a completion, or it's a 
positive semi-definite quadratic form. It's a sum of squares. And the rank is the number of squares that you need. So this gram dimension is the smallest number of squares that you need to write every non-negative quadratic form as a sum of that many squares. Okay. And then they have some nice results about this. So this number is small. So every um, every completable matrix has a PSD completion of rank at most three, if and only if there is no complete subgraph in your graph as a minor. And if you go to four, it gets more complicated, then you also need complete bipartite graph. You have to, this is an excluded minor theorem, and you have to also exclude complete bipartite minors, not only complete minors. And it's expect it's not entirely known what the list of forbidden minors is for k equal five, but it's expected to be complicated. Okay, so this is just also, a, I forgot the year. I think this was in the early 2000s um, that they proved this theorem. Um, it's also in the same context. Okay, any questions about this? This was part two of three. So the next would then be part three. Can I just ask a clarification on this definition? So in terms of the sums of squares case, you take a polynomial that can be written as a sum of squares, and mm -hmm. so the gram dimension is just the smallest number of squares. Yes. Yes, okay. So this QM, right, is some sum of squares representation, and this QM prime means you can do with at most k. Maybe not f. And it's the same completion, right? These two quadratic forms are the same. They just differ by coefficients of the monomials that you could get. Mm -hmm. So you want to bound the number of squares that you need. That's the translation, exactly. And this is really the rank. So you write this as, you know, a vector of monomials times m prime times m, right? And if you mm. factorize this, collect time, then you can do this with a rank, no? And mm -hmm. see, like a rank, what? Is it k by something, right? And this k then gives you the number of squares. And is it known if there's a relation between n and maybe the um, the size of the the edge set and what k is? Is there is there a relation between um, for like a general graph in that setting? You can hope for a relation if you drop this PSD. So it really gets more complicated. So you can get an estimation by counting sort of dimensions of objects, right? Well, it's the dimension of the matrices of rank K, and then you project them in a sense through this mm -hmm. graph map, and then you can estimate, do you get almost everything? But this PSD property really messes this up. So this is usually higher than what you would expect by doing this estimation, this dimension counting, because the PSD constraint is really relevant here. So maybe you have, you know, uh, rank K matrix in the fiber over your partially specified matrix, but no rank K matrix that's PSD. So this yeah. PSD constraint makes this a harder. Because you need it to also be a, like a moment matrix as well. Yes, so, yes. exactly. Okay. And this Thank inequality you. constraint makes it makes these rough estimates really rough. <laughs> so you cannot get a good bound just by counting dimensions of objects. Here. Okay, thank you. Are there any more questions?
Okay, I can't see any other questions. So maybe we'll just do the last part. Um, so I want to talk again about a different topic. Um, about, again, in the same setup, same type of questions, but a different focus. So I want to look at bi quadrants. I want to look at polynomials that have total degree 4, but they have only degree 2 in two different sets of variables. So how do you get such a thing? So the example to get such a thing is to consider now Segre in that case. So we had Veronese before, now we look at Segre. Um, so here's an example. If you take P1 cross P1. Okay, so what does this mean? So this is a space that has coordinates s and t, and this has coordinate x and y. And what you make out of this is a vector of length 4. Um, and you do this by taking all pairwise products of coordinates here and coordinates there. So here you list s times x, x times y, t times x, and t times y. So you make this they have always, these monomials have degree one in each set of variables, right? So this is one set of variables, this is another, and these are all the monomials that have degree one in both. So that's one way to think about this. Another way to think about this is that these here represent the two by two matrices of rank one. So you can take this as a column vector, this as a row vector, you multiply, you get a two by two matrix of rank one, and these are its entries written, for example, row-wise, right? You have to fix some order, it's not very important. So here in this example, I would read this row-wise and get these four numbers. So these are the rank one matrices of size two by two. So more generally, you would take size m by n. So to be quite precise, you have to do in this numbering, you would have to take m plus one by n plus one matrices of rank one. So you would take the column vector of coordinates here times a row vector of coordinates there, and you get a rank one matrix of size m plus one by n plus one. And you know, if you count its entries and you do minus one, you have this many entries of this matrix. So those are the Segre embeddings. Those are very classical algebraic varieties, and we're going to look, as always, at quadratic forms restricted to this variety, the image of this map. And so what we're doing is we take quadratic forms restricted to matrices of rank 1. It's really what I'm looking at, and these are bi-quadratics, so because they have degree 2 in the variables on this, which was S and T before, and degree 2 in X and Y. Every monomial is of degree 4, which is 2 plus 2, degree 2 in S and T and degree 2 in X and Y. And of course, you can have this in more variables. Still a degree 4 polynomial in, in total m plus n plus 2 variables, and it will always have every monomial would have degree 2 in these and degree 2 in those. Okay, so for example, on P1 cross P1, let's take this quadratic form in four-dimensional space and restrict it to the Segre embedding, which means you plug in a rank one matrix on both sides. And I multiplied this out, right? The diagonal entries correspond to the squares, right? The one one entry is the coefficient of x squared, s squared, x squared. This is the coefficient of s squared, y squared. This one, the coefficient of t squared, x squared, and this one of t squared, y squared. This is the first line here. So what is this 2? This 2 is 1 half times the coefficient of sx times tx, right? This is 1, 3, so you take 1, 3, and this 2 gives the other half coming from 3, 1, right? So that's why you have a 4 here. This is degree 2 in s and t and degree 2 in x and y. This 3 here makes a 6, so this is the 2, 3 entry, so it makes this times this. STXY, degree 2 in S and T, degree 2 in X and Y. And this 5, you know, makes 3, 4, makes the product of this and this monomial, which is T squared X. Okay, so this is a biquadratic. Um, so it's a quadratic form restricted to a Segre embedding. And then um, another way, yet another way to think of these, is since they have degree 2 in X, 
n y and degree two in s and t, I can write them also as a quadratic form in x and y, right? This has a sort of, what is this called? Is this also a gram matrix? It's also a gram matrix now as a quadratic form in x and y. So it's a two by two matrix because we have two variables. But now the entries, of course, are polynomials in S and T, which is fine too. So I did this for this example here. Um, so here we collect um, all the, the coefficients of x squared as a polynomial in x squared. So we have x squared here, here, and here. And so we get these three terms. This is one half times the coefficient of xy. So here's an xy, here's an xy. So we get these two terms. And this is the coefficient of y squared, which has two terms, apparently. Okay. So from this point of view, they are matrix polynomials, right? So this is a matrix polynomial or a polynomial matrix. It's sort of the same for us here, no matter in which order you say these two words. And they are quadratic. So the entries of this matrix polynomial are restricted to have degree two. That's yet another way to look at a biquadratic. So it's a quadratic form restricted to the Segre, or it's a quadratic matrix polynomial or a quadratic polynomial matrix. Cool, and so more generally, of course, we can do this in any number of variables, and then we can ask, is every non-negative polynomial a sum of squares? And then we know, um, so the classification theorem that we saw in part one, tells us that every non-negative polynomial is a sum of squares if one of the two factors, let's say, without loss of generality, the first one is a P1. Because then it turns out, you can do the computation, um, that this is a, that this algebraic set that you get satisfies this degree x equals co-dimension x plus one property if and only if m is equal to one or n is equal to one. Let's say n is greater than or equal to n. Um, and so if both are at least two, then you can also compute degree and co-dimension plus one, and then you see that these numbers are different. So the two cones are different. So not every by not every non-negative by quadratic is the sum of squares. And now I'm going to ask a different question, maybe a question that at first sight seems slightly odd. So I want to um, compare these two cones. Um, the sum of squares cone is now strictly smaller than the non-negative cone if we say m and n are both at least two. Let's maybe be even more special. It turns out that in an application we want m equal n equal to, so we have biquadratics in three comma three variables. So we look at this non-negative cone and a way to compare them is to look at the different faces that these two cones have. These are convex cones, and I'm particularly interested, for mysterious reasons at the moment, at the two-dimensional faces that they might have. And I want to know how different these two-dimensional faces are. So in particular, I want to ask the question, does this cone have any two-dimensional face that does not intersect this cone? So here is an attempt at a sketch. So is very hard to draw. This is a high dimensional phenomena, and the only way I could come up with drawing them is in a polyhedral way. So these cones are absolutely non polyhedral, they're very complicated. But so suppose here this outer cone, let's take this as a sketch maybe of the non negative cone of quadratic, bi quadratic forms. And the question is how does the sum of squares cone sit inside? And sort of one way that it could sit inside is sort of very. Yeah, it's sort of very dense. Yeah, they, the all faces of the larger cone have some element of the smaller cone. So maybe you know the smaller cone has a whole segment in it. The segment can sit inside also in different ways. So for example, they can share an extreme point like here, or the smaller cone has two extreme points that are strictly inside the two-dimensional face. So these are cones, right? two-dimensional phase of the larger cone, like here or here or here, or maybe even the smaller cone only has one point inside this two-dimensional phase of the larger cone. So, but anyway, 
So in this example, every two-dimensional face of the large cone contains a square in this sketch, or a sum of squares at least. Or the question is, can it look like this? So here these faces always contain a sum of squares, but these two faces out here do not, right? The sum of squares cone stays away from these two-dimensional faces of the cone Px. And the question is sort of which scenario are we in, yeah? We know the cones are not the same, and we can try to gauge this difference in various ways, and this is maybe one way you can try to compare. Um, which situation is it, the left or the right? That's the question. And um, so I've computed the dimension of this cone. So this is a 36 dimensional cone. These both cones are 36 dimensional. And so it's a bit hard to picture this accurately. And the way to study this question, it turns out, is to make out of this biquadratic form a ternary sextic in the following way. So we start now with this biquadratic in three and three variables that I have now labeled x0, x1, x2, that's one group, and y0, y1, y2 is the other. And so this is the Segre embedding, this p2 cross p2, this vector of uh, three times three, nine um, monomials that you get as the pairwise product of every xi with every yj listed in some order. So this is a 9 by 9 matrix. So this is one way to make the biquadratic. The other way is the quadratic matrix polynomial way. So we make this a matrix polynomial in Y by separating out the variables in X. So this is a 3 by 3 matrix whose entries are polynomials of degree 2 in Y. Okay. And so now we're going to associate to this biquadratic form the following polynomial. We take the determinant of this 3 by 3 matrix. This is a 3 by 3 matrix with entries of degree 2. So what we get out is a polynomial of degree 6, right? So we have a product of 3. Every term of this determinant is a product of 3 polynomials of degree 2. So in the end, we get a polynomial of degree 6 because every term is a polynomial of degree 6. Okay, and this I call SB, right? The determinant of this B matrix, and that is, you know, classically known as a ternary sextic, a polynomial of degree 6 in 3 by. And some properties of this F, of this biquadratic, relate to the properties of this polynomial of degree 6. So, for example, the biquadratic is non-negative, meaning that this matrix here is positive semi-definite, then, of course, the determinant is non-negative. The determinant of a PSD matrix is non-negative. So, if the biquadratic is non-negative, the associated ternary sextic is non-negative. Turns out, if the biquadratic is a sum of squares, then the associated ternary sextic is the sum of squares. And here's a sketch, so it's an exercise. So, if you write this biquadratic as a sum of squares, it turns out that this is the same as writing the quadratic matrix polynomial as a Hermitian square, and then you can apply cauchy bini to this matrix identity and get an expression of the ternary sextic as a sum of squares. Also another interesting observation, there's an assumption missing here, so f is to be non-negative on p2 cross p2, and you have a zero of the polynomial, then the ternary sextic is also zero. And so here's a correspondence of points, right? So F has an X and a Y, right? Is a, is a rank one matrix. It has a column vector and a row vector. So X is the say column vector, Y is the row vector. So if this is zero at this tuple of points X comma Y, then the ternary sextic vanishes at the corresponding row vector of this point, you know, in P2 cross P2. Okay, so these observations are exercises, this is some yoga, you have to get used to this kind of thing, they're not hard, um, but maybe it requires some digesting of all these definitions. Okay, and then let me give you the answer. So the answer is we're in the left case, so this P 
this cone of non-negative polynomials does not have any faces dimension 2 not containing a square. So every two-dimensional face contains a square, or a sum of squares at least. So all these, anyway, I never know where to put the negation to make this more clear. So this will be a forthcoming paper, hopefully soon, on the archive, um, together with Greg Blackman, Bogdan Reiter, and Isabel Shankar. And it's really, this, the proof of our theorem goes via this associated ternary sexting. So we look at these polynomials in three variables of degree six, and we study this cone, right? This is the same as the cone in the notation before of the Veronese, the three upper embedding of P2. And the theorem that we actually show, which then implies this one, is that a non-negative ternary sextic is extremal in the cone of all non-negative ternary sextics, if and only if the associated curve, so the zero set of this polynomial in the projective plane, as a complex curve is a rational curve, and this rational curve will therefore have 10 singularities, if you know some counting properties, and all of these have to be real, actually real points of P2. And there was a previous result in a similar direction by Kunat and Scheiderer, who showed a different thing. They showed how to construct extreme rays of this cone given certain nice point configurations in the plane. So they gave lots of examples um, of this type, but they did not quite look at this question, so they did not quite show this theorem. So what does the one have to do with the other, right? Ah, yeah, before I can tell you that, I have to observe this, which follows from the proof, so it's not clear from the statement that this should be true, that these thingies here, these extreme points, are always determined if you give me nine. So it will have ten real zeros. This is sort of what this sentence here means. And it turns out that it is uniquely determined by any nine of them. And, you know, if some of them come together, you have to tell me how to count them with multiplicities properly, and I don't want to get into this, I will sweep this under the rug. So if you think of 10 distinct points, then any 9 out of these 10 singularities, if you insist that 9 of them should be singularities of a ternary sextic, then there will only be one solution to this system of linear equations, namely the extremer one, and this will necessarily have also the 10th root that you left out. That is what I mean here. So, you can give me any of the nine, will uniquely determine the f, and therefore also the tenth root. And this we use to prove that there is no two phase of the kind um, that does not contain any squares. And the thing to do is for contradiction, you assume that there were such a two phase, and you pick a relative interior point, f, it's a bi quadratic. And it's a relative interior point of a two-phase. So you can walk in some direction, direction G, and then you will hit the boundary of this two-phase in, of course, two distinct points, H1 and H2. And so it turns out that this F here, because it's in a two-phase, it must have at least nine zeros. It cannot have fewer than nine zeros, then it would not be a relative interior point of a two-dimensional phase. Some dimension count yoga that yeah, you have to do. Since f is non negative and it has nine zeros, it means that the determinant polynomial, the ternary sextic associated to f, has at least these nine zeros. Right? To every one of these zeros, there is a corresponding zero of the determinant sb. Right? And I'm sweeping under the rug that some of them could be the same, and then all this multiplicity thing I will not say more about. So this nine. Let's take it as nine distinct points, which is not quite accurate. So technically, you have to deal with the multiplicities of these roots that you see. So, but if you go to the boundary of such a phase, somehow you have to become more zero, right? I mean, you have a non-negative polynomial, you keep subtracting something. So you hit the boundary if, at some, in some sense, you became more zero. So the simplest case in which you can become more zero is you pick up an additional zero. So f maybe has nine distinct zeros, 
And so to become more zero means you pick up a tenth distinct root. Not the only thing that can happen. So you can have nine distinct zeros. And then as you hit the boundary, what also can happen is that the sort of leading form at one of the zeros changes. You have maybe a, a positive definite Hessian at the root for f. And now as you hit this boundary point, the Hessian at this point is not positive definite anymore, but has picked up a kernel. That is also becoming more zero, right? The leading form at a zero changed to be less positive. Also another way you can pick up more zero. So in some of these senses, these boundary points H1 and H2 are more zero than F. So they pick up something, either a new zero or some more kernel in the Hessian or something like this. So this is what this technicality means. You have to somehow quantify this more zero precisely. Okay, and this sort of is a problem with the previous fact that I've shown you, because this SF already has nine zeros. So these two polynomials, the sextics associated to these biquadratics, they have the same nine zeros, but they have also another one, right? And they pick up two different ones, right? Because here one, you walk in positive direction of G, and in the other, you walk in negative direction of G. So they cannot change the same zero by the same thing, you know, they, because I mean, it matters if you add or subtract the polynomial, right? And so the polynomials SH1 and SH2, they have now more zeros, they have 10, but they have the same nine as this one. And it turns out that if you have nine, you're uniquely determined by this previous fact down here. And that's the sort of contradiction that we're after. So we can study this cone of biquadratics through the determinant sextics, which are easier to understand. The ternary sextics, we kind of know some things about, and that is roughly how we arrive at this contradiction. So you might ask, why do we care about this case? Um, turns out that this kind of question is related to estimates in PDEs of composite materials, you know. As a, there's a technical motivation for why they care. They get better estimates if there weren't such faces, if there were such faces as there are not. So it's kind of sad for the analysts that this does not exist. And so they, they have to contend with the bad estimates in their PDE inequalities that they have, they would have liked better ones. And this theorem show, shows that in their context, there are no better inequalities than those that they already know. That's roughly the context of this uh, work. But I thought it was fitting also for this kind of perspective on this whole thing. Okay, that was my part three. Any questions? Uh, yes, hello. Yes. Uh, I wanted to know if you can give an, uh, a geometric insight on what, is, what does it mean to change the, say, the coefficients from real coefficients to polynomials in, the, in a separate set of variables. When you move from the segre uh, expression of, of a B homogeneous uh, quadratic form, to the single homogeneous case. Not sure I understand your question. So here, like on, so how uh, on, the, on, on the left hand side, you have the, the matrix with coefficient, with real coefficients. And so you are considering a certain kind of variety. While on the other hand, on the BST, the, the coefficients here are polynomials. So essentially you are replacing the real coefficients with uh, polynomial coefficients. And maybe there is, a, I don't know, a localization or something that you are doing. So I'm really sort of, it's only a different way to organize the same information. So you could define a linear contraction map 
taking sort of this matrix. Oh no, no, I have the wrong thing. Old people and new devices. Okay, so you can directly define a map that takes this matrix and makes this two by two matrix out of it. So there's a linear transformation mm -hmm. that takes these coefficients and makes this polynomial matrix out of it. It's really a different way to organize the same information. And it's really even invertible, right? You can take this two by two matrix and then this determines this. Okay. Vertible linear transformation, the same information. Okay, thank you. Uh, and I've got a question um, for the last uh, part of your talk. The so what what is the problem when you go to higher dimensions? So that these facts, like when you have nine roots, you get a tenth, only exist for like these low dimensional examples. There is some numerology here that has to work out. Yes, so in more dimensions and other degrees, it doesn't work out so nicely. So that's sort of this number nine, where are the different lines? So that this number nine here, right? If you have a two phase of this cone, that you have at least nine zeros, coincides with the number nine of the fact is a sort of numerology that numbers oh, okay. come out the right way. I see, okay. Can also take a brief look if I can find it. This exercise sheet that I made. Of course, we have no time to actually do them, <laughs> but maybe, however, I can't find it. It's apparently on the workshop website where the tutorial information is, but I lost the link to it and I can't find it. Does somebody know where to find the? Uh, I don't oh. think it's online on the website yet. I see. Okay. Um, maybe you could share your screen if you've got it. Can probably do that too. I have to take this and then I have to do, do this, do this. Oh, Lynn is saying that uh, she'll uh, upload it now. Oh, great. Excellent. Somehow I cannot. Oh God. <laughs> cool. That is the thing. Can you share the thing? I cannot. On my. Here I am. Uh, I do not see it on the website yet, but. Uh... Mm -hmm. So what happens if we click on. Anyway. All right. Maybe that's a bad idea. Then. But I think I might be able to share the uh, share the, the exercises you sent. That would be great. So it's some, you know, some of the things I mentioned in my presentation are now problems for you to solve. Um, the link in the chat, if I understand this conversation correctly, will work soonish. So you can download as a by parts. So. I don't think there's a tutorial session planned for this presentation, right? No. I think there's a scheduled time to discuss this, but so I encourage you to discuss them. You can also reach out to me and we can find a time to discuss them. You can 
contact your poema colleagues in Konstanz, for example, who are destined to know some of these things already or can point you in the right directions if you're interested. Okay. Okay, it seems they're now available. Thank you. Yes, there's uh, under exercises at the bottom of the page. Cool. Okay. Well, uh, unless we want some time for discussion now, then maybe we could go to lunch early. Uh, and uh, if there's no more questions, we can meet again at uh, 2 p.m. All right. Thanks. Thank you very much for the talk.